I'm here today with Lee Cooperman, who's the CEO and founder of Omega Advisors. And Lee, cannot thank you enough for taking the time today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, before we begin, let's talk a little bit about what life was like growing up in the South Bronx. Well, you know, it's the rough and tumble section of the Southeast Bronx. Uh, I'm the first generation born American in my family, first generation to have gone to college. Uh, my education, I went to public school, public school 75 in the Southeast Bronx. I went to high school in the Southeast Bronx, Morris High School. Uh, and then I went to Hunter College, which uh, I followed the uh, advice of uh, uh, Horace Greeley, uh, go west, young man. So I went to the West Bronx. I went to Hunter College uh, in the, in the uh, West Bronx. And then I worked for a little bit of time and then went back to school and got an MBA from Columbia uh, University Graduate School of Business. And uh, I enjoyed growing up in the Bronx. I had a lot of friends, uh, and uh, we were, five of us were kind of inseparable. We always played ball after school, whether it be stickball, baseball, basketball, football, depends upon the season. Right. But it was a, I have fond memories of my growing up in the Bronx. You went to Hunter, and then you went to work at Xerox for a couple of years. I started working there around, um, I think it was August of 1964. And shortly after I joined the firm, that was right after I graduated from uh, Hunter, uh, they decided to go to a 24-hour work week, meaning every week it was a different shift. So one week I'd have to work from 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, the following week 4 in the afternoon to midnight, and the following week midnight to 8 in the morning. And I was enrolled in the University of Rochester Graduate School of Business, and it was very difficult because the weeks that I had uh, classes that I was on the 4 in the afternoon to midnight shift, I'd have to find another similarly situated uh, worker student and switch off. So work 16 hours for two days so I could go to school at night. And my wife, uh, I've been married 52 years, same woman, said, uh, I'm willing to work. Why don't you go to school full time? <clears throat> and we went back uh, to uh, New York City and I went to Columbia Business School. And that really kind of changed my whole career path, my whole life. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky. Yeah. I mean, did you ever think you know, when you were growing up, that you were going to end up on Wall Street and going to Goldman Sachs. Actually, a funny story, uh, one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Uh, back in the 60s, and it may still be the case today, if you finish your major and minor in college in three years, you could count your first year of medical or dental school towards your fourth year of college and get a separate degree. So in the summer of 1963, I took physical chemistry in the laboratories at University of Pennsylvania to finish off my major. I rolled, enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania Dental School in August of 63. And after eight days, I started to wonder if I was making the right decision. It was rather courageous and painful at the time because uh, I had to go to the dean of the uh, dental school and explain to him that I would like to go back to my undergraduate school and finish off my fourth year unencumbered by any decision um, and decide then in the fullness of time which way I wanted to go. He put me probably unfairly, fairly, I'm not sure, on a guilt trip saying I deprived the 101st applicant of a dental education. Yeah. I wasn't smart enough or sophisticated enough to know at that time that if they go back to the wait list, they could have, uh, after eight days, could have brought in somebody who was the, on the wait list. Uh, and I lost the tuition, I lost the room and board, and my parents were upset with me for, uh, you know, uh, that decision. They were kind of thinking to themselves, their son, the dentist, and uh, uh, but it was the greatest decision I ever made. And it was really at Columbia Business School which honed my interest in security analysis and in Wall Street. I had a, a very, very, uh, you know, uh, excellent professor by the name of Roger Murray, uh, who was a practitioner. He was an adjunct professor of business. During the day, he was a senior person at College Retirement Equities Fund, which is the pension plan for the t teachers throughout the country. And he was just a terrific uh, mentor and educator. And... Um, it uh, honed my interest, and uh, I was a pretty serious package at the time because this was 1966 when I was interviewing, and Wall Street was at a high. They didn't realize at the time that was going to be a high for about 16 years, uh, but I had a six-month-old child. I was a uh, straight A's in finance. I had a, uh, uh, I guess it was called Beta Gamma Sigma, the National Business Honor Society Award, and I was the Wall Street St Journal Student Achievement Award. So I was an attractive package. I had a bunch of job offers, and I liked the people most that I met in the interviewing process at Goldman Sachs and started my career there, and I spent uh, close to 25 years. Yeah. So I, I've, led, I've led like a charmed life. I've worked very hard, but, you know, 
a lot of life is being lucky, and I've been very lucky. So at Goldman, what was that experience like? Because that was during the day. Of, uh, Goldman was still a partnership. I retired from Goldman before they went public. I retired at the end of 91, and I think they went public, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not quite sure, I think maybe 1998 or something like that. I started out at the bottom of the ladder. I started off as an uh, analyst, uh, uh, associate analyst working for a senior analyst, and I progressed through the ranks. and. Uh, uh, we set up the uh, a position called the Chairman of the Investment Policy Committee. I became Chairman of the Investment Policy Committee, uh, formulating market strategy. And then in 1976, after being at the firm about nine years, I was elected partner and made partner in charge of the Investment Research Department. So I had the dual title at that time of uh, Chairman of the Investment Policy Committee and uh, a partner in charge of investment research. So I, I really had a dual role. In my role as partner in charge of research, I was like an orchestra leader. I had to manage the 100 plus person research department. And then in my role as chairman of the investment policy committee, I competed in the category of st portfolio strategy in the institutional investor all America team. So I carried water on two shoulders. Why did you, um, why did you decide to go out and set up, set up your own hedge fund? Well, it's a long story. I'll try to simplify it. I, I, I love my career at Goldman Sachs. It was a wonderful experience, great people, great firm. I learned a lot. Um, I spent uh, about 22 years in research, and I was always an agitator at Goldman Sachs that they were making a mistake uh, not going into the money management business. And for about 10 years, they told me I didn't get it, uh, that uh, their attitude was the broker should do brokerage, the money manager should do money management, don't compete with your customer because Goldman Sachs' typical customer was an institutional investor that was a professional money manager and they were very fearful of going into a business that competed with the customer. And, uh, but the world had changed around them and they were slow to recognize it. You know, you had Merrill Lynch Asset Management, CSFB Asset Management, Webster Asset Management, which was a division of Kitta Peabody. But the firm that changed their attitude was one day uh, Salomon Brothers, who was their arch trading rival, announced that Bob Solomon Jr. Uh, was leaving the research department to start Salomon Brothers Asset Management, at which point the firm came to me and said, you know, we made a mistake, uh, uh, we waited too long, you were right, we were wrong, would you be willing to leave research and uh, build asset management like you built research? I said yes, and uh, I realized that after about a year I had made a mistake, and I say that with a big smile, uh, uh, because Goldman's needs were the right needs for the firm, and my interests and needs were somewhat different. So finally, uh, the, uh, I would say the straw that broke the camel's back, but the decisive factor that led me to make my decision was I wanted to start a hedge fund as part of the asset management business. And this was uh, circa 1989, 1990, and the firm was very reluctant to do that because they were fearful that you know, I would get short an investment banking client to the firm, the client would find out, and we'd have a lot of aggravation over it. And even though my bias is, ten, is a long bias. And so I decided to retire, um, and um, I gave the firm a great deal of notice, a couple years notice of my decision to retire. And I have a wonderful relationship with the firm. I believe in noblesse oblige. I believe I have a great debt of gratitude to Goldman Sachs. And uh, uh, I do actually manage money for Goldman Sachs. I'm an option on their profit sharing and pension plan. Okay, and then you started at Omega Advisors, which has been phenomenally successful. And behind every incredibly successful person out there, uh, we've all made mistakes along the road. What are some of the mistakes that you've made? Well, my mistakes can be uh, paraded up Fifth Avenue, five abreast. <laughs> and I've always said that in this business, if you don't make mistakes, you either don't make decisions or you're a liar. Mm -hmm. So I've made plenty of mistakes. Um, I would say that the one that stands out uh, most, uh, I had an employee uh, who uh, brought us into an investment in Azerbaijan taint, that turned out to be tainted by corruption. Um, uh, he wound up going to jail well after he left the firm, but it was an embarrassing, difficult situation. Uh, we lost a great deal of money, uh, um, had involvement with the government, and uh, um, it, it was a, a painful experience, but we, we survived. I've had down years. You know, when I started the business in 1992, Jan 1 to be precise, uh, I shared with my investors, you know, typically a prospective investor would come in and say, well, Lee, uh, uh, what, are you, what am I going to earn if I invest with you? And I always would say the same thing to them. I don't know what I'm going to earn, but let me tell you what would make me happy. Because what makes me happy doesn't make you happy. That's the basis of a flawed relationship. I'd rather not invest. So my objectives are number one, uh, no down years. I'm a hedge fund that could be short, that could be out of the market. 
If I lose money, I got it wrong, and I can't be happy about that. Uh, number two, I like to beat the S&P net of fees. I don't want to walk into a client meeting and underperform some mindless benchmark and make a lot of money in the process. So I like to beat the market, uh, uh, and we use the S&P 500 as our benchmark. Number three, I don't run a leveraged portfolio, so I say you know, 10 to 12 percent returns after fees would make me happy. Um, and fourthly, I'd like to have less volatility than the market. And so, you know, I've had, I think, three or four down years in 24 years, uh, um, but we've always come back very strongly. Our record over the entire period of Jan 192 to date is about four basis points, better than the S&P 500 net of all fees, and we've done it roughly about 70 percent net long with very little leverage ever employed. And what have been some of your greatest victories? My Longest involvement was with a company called Teledyne, where I developed an enormous respect for Dr. Henry Singleton. But a lot of that preceded uh, Omega. Um, and uh, the, uh, I made an investment in Lynn Broadcasting in, two th in 19, uh, I guess, 74 during a big bear market back then. And I bought the stock, a split adjusted for an eighth of a dollar, and was taken over for $150.11 by Mc Core Cellular, who ultimately was taken over by AT&T. Gaia. I'd say that's, that's a victory. Yeah, well, it was a long period of time coming, but uh, you know, uh, I don't want to go through another 1974. You know, you go through 74s or 2008s, you know, if you have the capital and the courage, you can make a great deal of money, but the conditions that exist in the country are pretty debilitating. So I'd rather not go through that environment again.